Well, I went to uh, another shooting match yesterday, so I was you know, getting more inspired to buy the app. Yep. <laughs> no, you don't have a character type, but you do have a string type. So basically, you use that to also handle indi individual characters. Okay. So there's no there's no single char type, but its char is basically a string with only one character in it. Are you? Planning to process a string character by character? Well, I, I wanted to. I wanted to have the the space bar activated with that. Hmm. That may not work in App Inventor because that. because key presses do not uh, start any event handlers. And so it was a character compare the character of the space. But but the keyboard event does not trigger an event. Yeah. So you, you, there's no way to process it like that. Yep. All right, so I think we are for the most part here. So what I'll do is I'm going to uh, go over the notes that I mentioned in my email over the weekend. And we'll start with that. And you know, this is something that I just wrote, uh, which is you know, over the weekend, because I thought, hey, many of you might have, um, may not have experience with this sort of programming. So it is you know, kind of important that we understand what we're dealing with and how do we structure our programs to handle this. Yep, go ahead. Oh, I thought you had a question. No, okay. All right. So we are dealing with you know, threads or you know, logical sequences that are broken up by events. Okay, you know, why? so this will explain what we're talking about here and why it happens and then how to handle it. And the best way to illustrate this is really just go back to my uh, program that I wrote the other time, the app inventor mit.edu. And sign into my current account. And it's the MD5 program. The MD5 program is the basis of your homework assignment. Um, yeah, it happened last time too. And it somehow it fixes the problem. Okay, it's the blocks that are important. So let's see if the nope doesn't like it. And the second time it loads, just like last time. Okay, so we'll take a look at this program, and I'll try to explain you know what I mean by a thread broken up by you know logical by broken up by events. So we'll get back to the notes here, make sure that we are still recording. Excellent. And um, OK, so logically, this is what we want to do. Okay? Logically, we are trying to make use of JavaScript to compute the MD5 hash of a particular string. That's what we want to do. And we already know that uh, the script inside the HTML document should work. OK, it's demonstrated that it, it's working. So these, these are the steps. First thing is to set up the URL. We don't, you, your program doesn't have to do that because the URL property of the web viewer component is already set up correctly. So you don't have to do that. The second thing is we want to specify the string where you know, that we want to get an MD5 hash from. We want to set a string to web view string of the web viewer component because that's how you get information into the um, JavaScript code inside the HTML document. Are we doing okay so far with this discussion here? Okay. And then the third step is to use the golden block of the web viewer in order to quote unquote load the HTML document. Okay. Now when we say load the HTML document, 
it is also going to execute the associated JavaScript code inside the HTML document, which is the bottom line. Okay, we don't really care so much about the HTML document because there's nothing in the document. What we want is to initiate the execution of the JavaScript code inside the HTML document. And then the fourth step, which is kind of like logical, is to say when we are done with you know, computing the MD5 code inside the JavaScript code, we want to get the result back also using the web view string. That's what we want to do. But there's a problem with between step three and step four. Okay? You cannot have step three and step four in sequence because of one reason. Every single app only has one single thread. Okay? Which basically means it can only do one thing at a time. The web viewer, in order to run the PH, in order to run the JavaScript code, cannot run the JavaScript code while you are inside an event handler. That is the limitation. In other words, if I go back to the blocks, I can show you exactly where the problem is. Well, I wouldn't call it a problem, but this is you know, where things get a little bit tricky. This is the block that is initiating the request. It's basically saying, okay, web viewer one, when you have time, okay, go ahead and load the URL, load the web page. That's what it's saying, okay? When you have time, go do it. So what I'll do is I'm gonna change or add to the comment here. Trigger the display of the page and hence triggering the execution of the code. But the web viewer can only execute JavaScript code after this event handler is done. Okay? That is going to put a big limitation because it but what it means is until you get to the end of this click event handler, the web viewer doesn't get any execution time. Which as a result also means that if you try to get web you string back in the same event handler, you're not going to get a result back. Because the JavaScript code inside web viewer will not get a chance to execute until this entire event handler is done. I mean, is that okay or not? Does everybody understand the concept? Yep. You're calling, okay, never mind. You're calling the, that uh, when button compute click is the event handler. Correct. Yep, go ahead. So we can make the call inside the event. We just can't check it until after. You can check it, but it won't be there. It won't be done. It, it won't, won't be started. Done. Yep. Okay. It will start. It will basically this block here, the one that I pointed at using the mouse pointer, that's just a request and say it's a note to self and say, when I'm done with this block, this is what I need to do. Okay. That's all it is. It's just a little reminder that you put in your planner and it's not doing it. Okay, so until the end of this entire event handler, the, the web viewer doesn't get any time, execution time, to execute the JavaScript code, which is what we need to compute the MD5 hash. Is that okay? So that's why you know we have to say, okay, so how do I get the result back? Because I want to utilize the MD5 hash for certain things. In this particular program, I just want to display the label, but in your program, you have two places that need to compute MD5 hash. The setup needs to compute MD5 hash to store, and then the sign-in needs the MD5 hash to compare to whatever is already stored. Is that making any sense so far? Okay. So in this particular program, even though there's only one place I need it, I still have to use this approach. So the way I did this is to set up a countdown timer and say, okay, the timer, or there's a timeout counter, we start with five, it's counting down. So it goes from five, four, three, two, one, zero, okay? And then I enable the clock, the clock is where the timer is located, so I enable the timer. So every 200 milliseconds, it's gonna trigger this particular event handler, okay? So let me scroll down a little bit so we can look at the second event handler. So the second event handler is the timer event, for the timer event. Every 200 milliseconds, it's going to tick. Every 200 milliseconds, this block executes. 
when it executes, the first thing it's, it's going to check is to say, are we running out of time? Okay, because the, the countdown, um, count, the timer counter, counter is counting down. So it started with five. So the first time I get here, timer time out counter is five. And then the second time is going to be four, then it's going to be three, two, one, and then eventually it will be zero. This is just a little demonstration of how to write a procedure that returns a value. Okay, so I call that stupid zero, which has a value of zero. So we are actually just comparing the zero. So if the time out counter is less than or equal to zero, we just ran out of time. We, we have already waited one whole second, and it's time to make a conclusion and say, okay, I guess we're never gonna get the MD5 cache back. Let's handle that error, okay? But it's not gonna happen here because the HTML document is not a web resource, it is on in your app itself, so we can always get to the document. So which also means that the then branch here really should not execute at all, okay? If you don't make a mistake, this should never execute. We should only be able to, we should be able to get to the else case here. So the else case is basically saying, okay, the timer has, we are not running out of time yet, okay? But how do I know whether MD5, the MD5 hash is done computing or not, okay? So the first thing we do is we compare the web view string from the web viewer, okay, which is the mechanism to pass the MD5 hash back to the text inside the text box here. So this is how I compare and say, okay, remember that thing that I asked you to compute the MD5 hash of? Is it still the same as before? If it is, then it means that we are not done yet, okay? So if there's a match, then we say, okay, let's decrease the count the counter by one because we have just you know, passed 200 milliseconds and I'm, not, I'm still not getting any results back. On the other hand, if this equal is not true anymore, which means you know, the string inside the text box is no longer the same as the web view string, then I say, oh, okay, we just got the MD5 back, MD5 hash back. So let's change the label to the MD5 hash to display it. But that's the entire purpose of this program, is to show you this mechanism. Okay. Are we okay with this particular program? Yep. Could we do it with a while loop nope. instead of a... Tried it already. Well, why does it work? Hmm? Why, why does that work? It won't work because, something, uh, the, because of, this, of the thing that I said earlier. As long as you're inside this event handler, the web viewer does not get execution time. The web viewer only gets execution time after you get out of the click event handle. So you can you can put an infinite loop here and say, I'm gonna wait as long as the web viewer string has not changed. It's just it will just keep waiting there forever. And the reason for that is because the last line of the event handler for the button is to send it to the event handler for the clock. Right? The reason is that that's why it doesn't compute anything while it's in that event handler. No, the reason is because Android itself uses a single thread model oh, okay. for the entire program. So if I were to draw a picture, okay, this is this is the picture. So we have a click event handler here, okay, and then we have something you know. This is our web viewer one as a component, right? So. To us, there are several things that can happen at the same time. This is a web viewer, it has, it, it, it has its own code to execute you know, separately, and then when I click, this code happens, right? This code will start execution. But the, because there's only one single thread, which means the processor can only be doing one thing at a time, right? So while it is doing something here inside the click event handler, this does not get execution time. It's only until we get to the end of the click event handler, then the processor or the operating system will then say, okay, who else needs execution time? Well, when you say go home here, you're leaving a note to yourself and say, okay, this is what I need to do after the event handler is done. So that's why the operating system, Android, remembers and go, oh, right, you did ask for some execution time for your web viewer. So after the end of this click event handler, Finally, you have time to execute the script in your web viewer one, which is where the JavaScript code is located. 
So that's why you have to break up that single logical sequence into multiple parts. Question, yes? Yeah, so does it always happen right after me? Um, it's up to the scheduling of the Android operating system, but it does remember, you know, all the things that it, is, that it needs to do. Um, in addition to running code inside the web viewer and other things, it also needs to update the screen and stuff like that. Okay. So even a lot of that stuff does not happen as you specify the code here. It actually ha it actually happens when you're not um, when you're out of the event handle. Okay. Because it, how does the clock does it interrupt in the middle of the event? That is a good question. You know, I do not know for sure whether it is you know it has an interrupting nature or whether it just you know it waits until everything is done then the, time, the timer can tick. That I do not know for sure. The only way to know that is to have an infinite loop of some kind in the JavaScript code, so it keeps updating something on the screen inside the web viewer, and then we can check whether the timer still ticks or not. So that would be the only way to check whether, whether uh, the timer can interrupt the execution of your web viewer. Okay. But I do not know for sure yet. Yep. Nothing else that we know of, and uh, just, just for your homework assignment, this is the only thing that cannot no, work. The for, for the anything that, the okay, anything that has a nature of, you know, we don't know how long it will take to com to complete, will fall into this you know category. When you look at blocks inside app, okay, can you let me finish? Thank yes. you. So when you look at the description of blocks in App Inventor, it will tell you, you know, certain operations will not complete the actual operation, but you need an event to handle it. This is the one that is not really well advertised, and that's why we need to do it separately. That's why we need to do it the way it is done here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, just for instance, some more examples of such, uh, such events that cannot be uh, executed inside of event handler. Probably a database request. Sorry? Database request. A database request, okay, so if you go back to the components, <clears throat> and this kind of goes back to, you know, when you read the description of the components, you kind of have to read it carefully. Um, when you get to connectivity, um, the web component by itself is one of those. Okay, so when you look at the methods, which basically correspond to blocks inside App Inventor, and you get look at this get here. Okay, so if you look at the get event, let's let's read this part here. Okay, I know it's a little bit small on the screen. I will. It doesn't really help to bump up the font size because just uh, okay, let me. I'm trying to find out whether I can copy and paste this into a different uh, app so that we can use a larger text. No, it doesn't do it. We need a line wrapping. Word wrap, there we go. Okay, so I know it doesn't really wrap around very nicely, but at least we can read it. Okay, so get performs an HTTP request using the URL property and receive, receive the response. Um, so this one does get it back immediately. It doesn't say that it will do it later, okay? Let's look at the other one. Let's look at post. So when you look at post, this is the, uh, the other one. Okay. And I'm gonna turn off line numbers because it's not needed here. Okay, so when you look at this first sentence here, does it imply that you have to wait? Or does it state clearly that you know this block would also give you the result? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> the 
and receives the response. Okay, which also which basically means this block is going to wait until the response comes back. Okay, because it receives the response. On the other hand, when you look at the post text, performs an HTTP post request using the URL property and the specified text. Does it say anything about receiving the response in the same block? No. So the only thing it's going to do is to make the request, but it doesn't get it back, right? So when you read the third paragraph here, if the safe response property is true, the response will be saved in the file and the got file event will be triggered, which means when it is done receiving the reply and save the reply to a file, then you get a, the, a, an event called got file. And then in the event handler of got file, then you can specify whatever you want to do with the file that you have, to, that you have just received. Yep. So our issue is we don't get an event. That's really the issue, right? So we don't get an event from the Correct. So from with the JavaScript. Yep. So with your homework assignment, the issue is we have something that looks like this, but we don't get an event when it is done. So we, now we have a problem because how do I know the answer is done? Yep. Sorry, I was. Oh, okay. okay. So basically, you created your own event, a time event. To handle. Exactly. So I created my own event using a timer and basically just say, okay, let's check. Not done yet. Check. Not done yet. So that is the reason why I had a timer because you know we have to, we cannot do it in the same event handler. We have to use a separate handle, handler to get the reply, to get the response or the answer in this case of the MD5 hash computation. That might be a nice feature to add to that block. Huh? Mm, you may or may not want it because you don't know how long the JavaScript code is going to take to complete its calculations. And on certain web pages, you might have you know JavaScript you know that is running periodically to update something on the screen. You know we have seen all that you know, seen all that stuff. So you cannot you, you don't know how long it will take to get the result back. So you cannot really just say okay when you're done let me know. This, this, with this one, we can have a got file event because it doesn't do any processing. We are not executing any JavaScript code in the web page itself, which means you know, that either, you get it, either you get a file or it times out and it dies. But in the case of running JavaScript code inside the web viewer, that can be timer driven inside the HTML code, it's inside the HTML page. So there's no way to tell when it is done. Are we doing okay so far with, with this discussion? Okay. So your homework assignment is a little bit more complicated than this. Okay, and I'll show you exactly why that is the case. I'll draw the picture so that you can have a kind of tutorial way to see this. I'm gonna turn on the <coughs> light to the front. Okay, so with your homework assignment, it's a little bit more complicated because you have two buttons that can eventually eventually trigger the calculation of MD5 hash. You have your setup button, okay, this is, the felt is gone. And then you have your sign in, sign in button. Do you remember you have your homework assignment? So the setup event handler, okay, this is uh, the setup click event handle. So somewhere along here, there's a go home here. In order to calculate the MD5 hash to store as the MD5 hash of the password when you set up an account. So it needs the MD5 hash here. When you sign in, somewhere within here, <coughs> it's also go home because you need to compute the MD5 hash of whatever is in the form in the app and compare that to the stored MD5 hash that is in TinyDB. So in either case, you have two blocks here, two event handlers. Each one will try to use go home to compute the MD5 hash. Is this part okay? Does everybody kind of understand how this applies to your homework assignment? Okay. But in each case, you have to use the mechanism that we just talked about. You cannot get the hash value right away back you know, in the same event handler. 
So each one will set up the timer and say, hey, you know, timer, you know, come back and uh, let me let, check whether we have the result or not. So now you have the third event handler, which is the timer one. Okay. So we have a timer event handler, right? Similar, very similar to the one that I already have. But there's one big difference, okay? First of all, how do you know whether you have the result back or not? You cannot compare web view string to the text of a particular text box anymore. Well, can you? Well, I guess you, you still can, okay? So you can, you can reapply that technique. But you'll be comparing the, to the text of a password text box and not a regular text box. But you can still use that technique to detect whether the computation of MD5 hash is done or not. The question is, now that you know you have an MD5 hash, what are you going to do with it? Okay. So somewhere in this code here, okay, somewhere inside the timer event handler, okay, you have, let's say this block here confirms that you have the MD5 hash. Okay. So dot the MD5 hash in web view. So at this point, you know that you got the result. Yep. So the way that Go Home works is no matter what function or event handler it's in, it doesn't evaluate anything until after that event handler is done? Correct. Because Go Home is nothing more than a note to self and say, when I'm done with this event handler, this is one of the many things that I need to do. So you can leave a note to yourself as many times as you want, but it won't do a single thing as far as actually executing the code. Concerned. Okay? But this is the bigger problem that you have. Is when you get the MD5 hash in this particular event handler, how do you know whether you were trying to fi finish your know, setup or finish signing signing in? How do you know? Do you guys see what the what the issue is here? Yep. Did you make a variable that holds the web viewer stream and then for each of them and then pass that to whatever specific one started? But, but how do you know what how do you know what you were trying to do when you're at this point? That is the problem. Okay? So what what, what do you think would be a, a solution? Have have set up call or have sign in call. Call what? Um, for the hash. But you cannot. But that's the problem because the only thing you can do here is to start the ex is to make a note to self and say, after this event handler is done, go ahead and compute the MD5 hash. Yeah. We can make a true or false statement within the each click event that sends some type of you know turned it on, turned it off, and then you know which which it was, which was set up. So okay. set up a variable like I was saying. A trigger one way or the other. And then a you local go. one or a global one? You need a global one because we need some kind of communication between event handlers. So you will need a global variable so that when you are coming from here, prior, well, somewhere within this block here, then you have to say, you have to remember the person or the thing that requested the MD5 hash is a setup. And then over here, you use the same global variable, but you remember whoever is requesting the MD5 hash is the sign up button. And then over here, you check that global variable. And then you say, okay, now I got the MD5 hash. Who was asking for it? Ah, look at this global variable. If this global variable is one, it's this guy. If the global variable is two, it is this guy. Then you continue the processing accordingly. Because now you know how you got here, who was the requester, then you know how to complete the re how to complete the sequence of that particular request. Are you completing the sequence in the timer or are you completing it outside of the timer? Well, it will still be inside the thread of the timer. You can separate it out as a subroutine, as a as a procedure. If you want to make it look clean, you can do that. But it will still be called from inside the timer event handle. And this is why it is a little bit cumbersome because now after this you have to say you have to use an if block here. So inside the if block there will be at least several pieces. 
This may correspond to handling the setup. This may you know, correspond to handling the sign in. Now, if you want to specify all the details here, that's fine. It just makes it a little longer. If you want to come put that code into a procedure to make it look clean, it's even better. But it's not required. But it will still be triggered from inside the timer event handle. Okay? So of these three pieces, you need one extra piece now. You need a global variable. So that here you will set the global variable to one thing. Here you set the global variable to something else. And then over here you check the global variable to see which value it has. Then you know how to continue the processing of the MD5 hash that you just got back. Is that okay? And this is why your app is going to be a little bit more complicated than period to do all this stuff here because global variables are global so they don't belong to any particular event handlers so the three event handlers will basically share that one single global variable these two will set the global variable this one will check or get the global variable and check it you need to know at some point you need to know which which timer has gone off. The, the but you only got one timer. We only have one timer. That's the other way that you can do is to use multiple timers. That's what I was trying to do. Okay, you can use multiple timers, which means in this one, you start timer one, and then in this one, you start timer two. So now, you know, depending on which timer has expired, you know who is requesting because each button has its own timer associated with it. So you can use that approach too. In, in that case, would you would you want to use two different timeout counters, two different? Because well, I tried doing it with the same one, and something I don't know if that was the problem, but mine was breaking. Okay, supposedly you should be able to use the same because the timers should not be active at the same time. So if you cannot use the same one, that means you did not stop the counting when it's time to stop it. So you know, getting to my getting back to my code here. So in the timer code, when you run out of time, you have to disable the timer. Okay, this re-enable actually disables the timer. It re-enables the button, but it disables the timer. And then on the other side, which is down here, we also have another call to re-enable, which also disables this timer. So if you have your code sharing the same count that, counter, from both timers and it's not working, it can be, not necessarily the case, but it can be because the timers are still, one timer is still ticking when it's not supposed to. So it's interfering with the counting of the other timer. Okay, any other questions? Any other suggestions, ideas? And by the way, you can always use the state of the button as an indication if you want to save a global variable. I wouldn't make it very, I, I wouldn't make it that way because it's really obscure. Yep. You men mentioned also passing two parameters to the... Correct. Now that one is a little bit more involved, okay? So I would just mention it, but it's not going to be 
recommended. Okay. So the other approach is to change the JavaScript code to receive a list of two things. The first item you do not process. The first item is really just a tag to identify who requested the MD5 hash. The second item is the string that you're converting into MD5 hash. So when you're done, you pass back the same thing. You pass back a list of two items. The first item is just the same item. Uh, first, the same first item from the web view string when you receive it. And then the second item is the MD5 hash. So this way you don't need a global variable because in the tiger event here, when you get back the MD5 hash, you also get back the identifier of who requested that. So you can do this whole, whole thing here without using an extra global variable. But I do not recommend it for several reasons. One, it involves the modification of the JavaScript code so that when you run your JavaScript code, you expect the web, web view string to be a JSON encoded list. And then you have to break it apart, keep the first item the way it is, process the second one. When you're done, then you have to do exactly the reverse, combine those, combine the first item from the incoming list, and then the second item is the MD5 hash, pack it back into a list, convert it into JSON format, put it back into web view string. So you have to do some modifications to the HTML document, which I did not intend the class to have to be able to do. Um, and then the second reason is that may not be an option sometimes. In other words, you may not have the ability to change the JavaScript code that you actually want to run. So that means you know, the, uh, that solution may not be applicable in some cases. So you might as well just use one approach that works in all cases. Right. So are there any questions? I, I want you guys to kind of think about this a little bit and see if you can just kind of go through this in your mind and go like, okay, I need to do this in my homework assignment. Are there any other questions related to what we just talked about? I'll probably postpone the deadline to next Monday. In fact, I'll just do it now. But I still want to make sure that you guys do not have any questions until, you know, then before we move forward to anything else. This is a full explanation of you know, why we are breaking up the logical sequence into multiple parts. Are there any questions? I mean, that also means, you know, Angela, your your solution is not working. Yeah. <laughs> At first, I thought like, well, you know, if that's working, it'd be great you know, to do it in the same block, and it seemed to work. Do you know why it seemed to work? Yeah. Because you never check whether um, the web view string is the same as the original text or not. So you were actually storing the password in plain text. Because <laughs> I, I was puzzled too. I was going like, hmm, it seemed to work. And how come it's actually not working? Uh, let's see. So I'm changing the, oh, I might have changed that already. Yep, I changed it to next Monday already. So you have one more week to work on this homework assignment. And remember, this one is going to be, it, it has two places like this, okay? The other one has to do with a notifier. Because you have to pop up notifier and say, oh, okay, an account already exists. Do you want to overwrite the account? But the notifier, the, the block that puts up the dialog box does not know the answer of the user interaction. It just puts up the dialog box and then finish the event handling. So when, you, when somebody clicks in the dialog box, it generates a second event. So in the second event, then you have to say, okay, which button is clicked? But we do have an example using exactly that mechanism earlier in the semester when I talked about the counter app. Remember the, the counter thing for Costco employees? Sort of, no? Okay, so it, it, it started off as, a, as an easy counter thing. You just clicked once and it will up the counter by one. But then I saved the count in TinyDB. So when you exit the app or restart the entire phone and you start the app again, it will check TinyDB and say, hey, I remember something from last time. Do you want to continue this count or not? Okay, so that particular app is going to be really helpful with this one because it shows you how to use TinyDB, how to see if something is already in TinyDB, 
and also how to use the notifier so that you can get a response back. Should I continue or should I abort the operation? So that would be you know, one of the apps that you should also look at in addition to MD5. So we have all the building blocks. We have you know, most, all, all of the techniques. Okay? We know how to deal with global variables. We know how to check the compare strings. Okay? We know how to use comparis, I mean, conditional statements. So all of these blocks, con uh, building blocks are here. The question is you know, how do we combine all of these things to do what we need to do? Okay, questions? Mm -hmm. Call the timer. Say again? Oh, never mind. Okay, so what I, what I can, can also do here, which is kind of giving away the solution a little bit here, but not to the point where it is trivial for you guys to do your homework, okay? So I, I don't want to do that. But I can make it a little bit easier on you, you know, by kind of illustrating what I just said here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I will do two text boxes and then two labels. When I say compute MD5 hash, there'll be two buttons to compute MD5 hash. So depending on it, okay, instead of talking, I'm just going to do it. Okay. And then we'll pick up another label and another button. Okay, so let me, let me turn off the screen first. I mean, the, the light is washing out. So what I'm doing is replicating the first three things, or three components, into the second part here. So I want to be able to compute a hash of this text box, and I also want to be able to compute the hash of the second text box. So I am, in a way, replicating what you guys have to do. Okay. So let me just label these things correctly first. Okay. So this is text box input one. I'm just going to rename it. And then this one's going to be input two. And this is label MD5 one. Because now I need, I have two sets. I have to identify which one is which one. And this is going to be label MD5 two. And then we have two buttons too. So I'm going to rename the buttons accordingly. So we have two sets. Okay, so the idea is I want to click the buttons. Okay, let me relabel the uh, the button itself, so it says the same thing. So compute MD five hash. Of the second, there we go. Okay. So this is yeah. Go ahead. Quick uh, question on the naming convention. Uh, are you always supposed to use the Pascal, or is there a situation where you should use Camel? And I'm not talking about so much for this, but just in general for mobile and Druid. In Java programming, you want to use the Camel case. Uh, in App Inventor, there's no actual standard. Okay. So, so you, you would start out with a lower case then? For variables, yes. But for components, for whatever reason, they always start with an uppercase. Okay. So I'm just going to keep using that standard. No, 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 that's what I want to know. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the idea of this app is, you know, if I click this button, it will compute this text box and the MD5 hash will show up here. If I click the second button, it's going to use the second text box and then reflect the answer in the second label. Is that okay? Does everybody see how this is a little bit parallel to your homework assignment? A little bit? Okay. All right. So now we go to the blocks and see what we need to do. Okay. So with a timer, I need to do modifications later on, but I will have to deal with the buttons first, okay? So let's see. I can replicate most of these for the second button. So we, would, we go to the second button and basically reuse this entire block here. Let's see what is the best way to do it. Can't you just replicate the whole block? Yes, but I need to be able to duplicate the whole block. When I say duplicate, it only duplicates one single chunk. <laughs> I have to drag it out, then I can replicate the whole thing. 
Hmm? Replicate the event handler. Yeah. Like so. Ah, okay. I see. I see. Okay, that works. So we have two, two, and then we still use the same web, web viewer. That's the whole point, right? Because we want to use the same web viewer. So for those of you who want to just waste resources but make your program really easy to deal with, you can duplicate the timer. You can duplicate the web viewer itself. <laughs> so you end up with two web viewers, one for each button, okay? But that approach is not recommended because it is wasting resources unnecessarily. So, yep? It looks like it changed something on your first block when you changed the name of the second block. No, it does, should not. Because they're, they're entirely separate. They're entirely not connected. Okay. okay. I did notice that like, if you change the name of a, a, a global variable or something, it changes it throughout. Yes. When you change the name of a global variable or a procedure, it would actually update the names of all the other references. Yep. Which is good, because otherwise, you know, if you do this in a text editor, you will have the global search and replace everything, which is a chore. Okay, so we have just replicated the, the behavior of the button, but then we have that problem that I mentioned earlier. In the timer, when I can see that I got the empty five hash, now I have a question like, okay, but which label am I supposed to update? That is my problem, okay? And also re-enable needs, needs to be done a little bit differently. So let me go to re-enable here. We can always just replicate these, you know, to enable the other ones too. So, so without even asking, you know, who was disabled to begin with, I just go, like, oh, let's just re-enable everything. Okay. But we have a question of, okay, but which labels text should I update? Okay, what do you think? Do I need a global variable in this case, or do I not need a global variable in this case? There's one, there's one clue I can use without using a global variable. But let's just say that I don't use that clue, clue, okay? The clue has to do with which button is disabled. Because in the click event handler, I disable the button corresponding to this click here. So that's a flag that I can check, okay? But let's say I don't use that, okay? Because I want to make this homework assignment closer to what you have to do. So I'm gonna use a global variable. So I would say initialize global name and change the name to md5 requester and just you know, make it an empty string because it is initially useless, okay? It's only when we get to here and also here that it becomes useful. So we say set global, oh come on. Set md5 requester to uh, this part here, you have you just have to be consistent. So I'm just gonna say um, button one, okay. And then I use the same thing in the other one and say button two. So now I can use this global variable, which is named uh, MD5 requester, and I can reuse it here inside the timer event handler and attach a conditional statement and probably put this block replicated twice. One is gonna go into then portion. And if I really want to be anal and you know, make sure that things are done correctly, I would use else if. So in here, the first thing I wanna check is to see, so this is gonna set the other one. So now I need a text compare okay, for equality. And I want to say, is the global variable, okay, MD5 requester, is it the same as button one or not? Oops. 
That won't work, would it? No. <laughs> and that's why it's not a good idea to use literal text, but I'm not, you know, the, the focus is not to make the strings consistent in this example, so I'm just going to do it this way. So in this case, I have a comparison to confirm that the MD5 requester is button one. If that is the case, I change the text of the first label. I could have just used else because there are only two requesters, but if I am really careful about, okay, you know, I just want to make sure that I don't make any mistakes anywhere, I'm going to check it also to make sure that only when the requester is button two, then I would change the text of the second button. I mean the second label. Is that okay? All right. And I'm not going to save this and upload it to the web because I want you guys to do this. <laughs> if I upload this to the web, you guys will just you know, drop this in the drop this into the backpack and <laughs> and reuse it, right? You know. So I don't want that. Okay. I want you guys to actually have to go through the trouble to change the program and do this because as you're doing it, hopefully it will sink in. Like, okay, this is why you're doing this and how the mechanism works, okay? All right. <clears throat> so I think this should do it. And I, th let's see, do I have the, hmm. this is the uh, emulator. Oh, I have to do it this way because I, I cannot run inside the uh, AI companion. So I have to do it this way. Um, start up the virtual machines. Actually, with this, I probably can move the, the due date back to Wednesday. But I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I don't want to go back to my own words. There we go. Start up the end.